Okay, so I understand that in the last exercise, uh, you would have done a forward projection. That's like doing A times theta with reference to the previous slides that I covered. And I understand also you did back projection, which we'll be needing in what we're doing next as well, which is uh, A transpose. And I think you have done A transpose on A theta. You have taken an image theta, forward model with A, and then back projected, so doing A transpose A theta, which gives you uh, A transpose A, um, which would have blurred your image effectively and replaced it with the shift variant uh, response function. We're now, though, going to look at um, how we typically reconstruct data, um, reconstruct images in PET. Um, and so from the previous uh, talk, we covered the parameter vector theta, and we're trying to estimate the parameter vector theta from the measured data vector m. And there is a representation of the measured data vector m. It's just a sinogram, and it's got Poisson noise. What we've just covered is how to map from parameters theta. Remember, that's the mean. This is a model of the mean number of emissions from each and every location in the field of view. So a model of the mean theta mapping through the system matrix A, that's the forward projection, those line intervals you've been doing, hopefully though with extra additions such as attenuation, normalization, positron range and so on. But anyway, forward modeled to simulate your PET scanner to give um, a model of the mean measured data. So that's Q is equal to A theta. And in essence, in most reconstruction methods, we have an objective function which compares your model of the mean data uh, with your noisy measured data. So even if you're doing a regular uh, line fit linear regression, your model of the mean is your best fit line and your noisy data are those scattered points around that you're trying to fit. Very simple analogy. And so with linear regression, of course, it's all typically these squares. Um, here in PET, we use a Poisson noise model, and so we're looking at a different objective function, maximum likelihood, which we'll be getting on to in the next few slides. But anyway, the objective function compares your model of the mean to see how well it uh, agrees with the actual noisy measured data, M. And then also at that point in the objective function, which we'll get on to towards the end of this talk, we can also inject some prior information about what we expect that image to look like. And then we use an algorithm which will modify the parameters theta such that when they're forward modeled and compared with the measured data vector m using your objective function such that they give a better evaluation of that. So in other words that would be giving you a smaller least squares uh, discrepancy in the context of linear regression for example. But in PET we're looking at finding a parameter vector theta which when mapped through A gives um, a higher a value of the so-called Poisson <coughs> likelihood, which we'll be getting to in detail as we go along. Yes, excellent question. Okay, so you brought a really stupid question. No, this is going to be the toughest question of all then. Go for it. I guess this model that you set up seems to me like you have a picture of the answer at the bottom right. Yeah. So where do you, I mean, you don't have right. that in real life. So Absolutely. That Absolutely. So that's the whole topic of this lecture. In reality, <laughs> theta, <laughs> We do not know. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is purely an illustration of the process. Um, and, and you're right, I guess I could have just put in a, a white box or a black box there uh, to indicate the fact that I don't know what that is. And in fact, it would be very hard to get that value, that estimate of theta from that noisy data there. Although with certain priors, actually, it, it could be possible. But yeah, it's exactly the topic of the lecture. Um, there I'm just substituting uh, those simple examples for, for, with uh, some real data. Unfortunately, the contrast on this display is not particularly good, but it just gives you an idea of what a transverse section through an FDG distribution um, would look like. This was data from the simultaneous uh, PET-MR scanner, the, the MMR, and that shows you a model of the mean, which not only does the forward projection, but also includes the normalization problems. That's why you get those gaps. Uh, those two gaps between the detectors, um, and also attenuation is in there as well, and the noisy data M. These are real examples, just to show uh, how it would really look like. 
Okay, so <clears throat> that's also in the more real case now, look at that model of the, in fact, yeah, this is now gonna describe, I'm sure that's what the slide is showing, we're now gonna describe the Poisson log likelihood that we want to maximize. So there's our measured sinogram data vector M. There is the image that quite rightly has pointed out, we do not know what theta is, okay? But just for illustrations, I'm giving you a nice useful uh, image there. But in general, that starts off with uniform values everywhere in the field of view, just set it equal to one, for example. And what we want to do is, uh, given that uniform image or whatever your current candidate guess is, is you forward model using your system matrix A to produce the model Q of the mean uh, for the data that was measured M, okay? Now, what we're gonna do to explain detail by detail what's done with the Poisson log likelihood is just consider one single sinogram bin um, index I, that's one sinogram bin. I've just used a very large red box there, which obviously contains many sinogram bins, but just that's just for visual aid. Just consider it as one single sinogram bin. And we have a number of counts M in sinogram bin I. And once we do a forward model from whatever our current image estimate of theta is, we will also get a model of the mean Q for that sinogram bin I. So we're only looking at one single data point MI and its corresponding uh, modeled mean value given whatever our theta is. Typically starts off with a uniform image. Then we can say, well, what is the probability of having measured M counts in sinogram bin I if the model of the mean number of counts was Q? Okay, so we know that this is Poisson distributed data. So without derivation, I'm just quoting the well-known Poisson probability distribution. Uh, so it's basically the mean value to the power of the measured value, exponential minus mean value divided by uh, measured value uh, factorial. So that gives us the probability of that many counts M being detected in sinogram bin I if the mean was Q. Now, what we're seeking to do is find the image values theta such that when we change the value, values of that image, so the vector theta, of course, um, describes any given image in that grid there, uh, we want to find the theta that is gonna maximize that uh, probability. But of course, it's not good enough to just maximize that probability for just one sinogram bin as shown there. I want to maximize that probability for each and every measured sinogram bin I. So for that reason, assuming that they're independent um, variables, I can just take the product of all of those probabilities and say, I'm looking for the image or the parameter uh, vector theta, which is the model of the mean, uh, we're giving the model of the mean Q, which will maximize the probabilities of all of those uh, sinogram bin measurements M. So that, that expression there is known as the Poisson likelihood, which is not very easy to maximize. We want to search for the pixel values theta that maximize that Poisson likelihood, the probability of all those measurements given that estimate of the mean uh, Q. It's not easy to maximize. So all we do is take the logarithm knowing that that will not change the location, uh, the, the theta that maximizes that expression because the log is just a monotonically increasing function. All we've done is just take a linear function, just flatten it. So uh, it's harmless to have taken the log. Um, the theta that maximizes that expression will not have changed, but it's much easier to, to maximize now. Okay, any questions on that before I go on? Is that all clear to everybody? What is the change that they are um, make the assumption that they are independent? They are not independent, but they are then they are. Uh, right. So the mean, the value, of the model of the mean depends on all of the values along that uh, line interval. 
but when you have Poisson measured noisy data, they are all independent from each other. In any given noise realization, sure, the, the means can be, uh, will be correlated with one another, because you, obviously you just... Yes. And that's the kind of projection that you did. Yeah, that's giving us Q, yes. But another line of response that goes the same space, if it's a hot pixel, it will be a line of response with something like that. That will be related in terms of the mean values, okay. yes. But the noisy measured data, uh, Poisson distributed noisy data, they are still okay. independent. Okay. There, there is a paper by uh, Ewan Fessler who talk about correlations due to that time. Yeah. Uh, but those are tend to be small, and so what they show that they did a lot of work and then showed it really didn't affect the industry So you can treat each right. Any other questions or clarifications? That's a, that's a good observation. So remember that model of the mean. What we're using is the following factorization. I'm showing you now what's done in practice for the MMR scanner. We would have some image theta. I'm giving you a pre-reconstructed result just for illustration purposes, but whatever you've got for the image theta. First of all, we can, for example, do a very simple convolution to crudely model uh, something like positron range, for example. But that can be any kind of blurring operator that you like that's going to try and capture, for example, even spatially varying positron range. Okay, so you can model resolution in the object or image space, first of all, with the matrix P. Then we can do our forward model with the, uh, sorry, do our uh, line integrals. So that gets you a sinogram from your blurred image. Then uh, we can multiply by the attenuation factors. So those are derived from the new map just by taking line integrals and then the negative and then the exponential. That's how you get attenuation factors from a new map. Uh, then we can multiply by the uh, normalization. These are not the normalization correction factors. These are effectively the reciprocal of the normalization correction factors. Because as I said earlier, we want to model the problem, not correct it when we're doing forward modeling. Um, and then we add on uh, some estimate of the scatter and randoms background. So that's uh, in practice a model of the mean data uh, that would be used. Take the image, if you're going to do resolution or PSF modeling, just blur it by that, that model you're using. If you're doing an image space approximation, other methods don't. Um, then do the, the ray tracing with the matrix X. Then multiply point by point in the sinogram space by the attenuation factors, and then finally the normalization effect as well. And then add on scatter and randoms. That will give you a good overall model um, for the measured data. And we normally just reduce that to a simplified Q is equal to A theta plus B. Any questions on this? Obviously, there's a whole lecture in and of itself to describe how you get the normalization factors. Attenuation factors are quite straightforward. It's more a case of how you get the new map. Um, but other than that, I hope it's all relatively transparent. Okay. okay, so assuming we have that model of the data, how do we go about maximizing the Poisson log likelihood? Well, that's the expression that we were seeking to maximize. That's find the image theta, the object representation parameters theta, um, which give the Q that maximize uh, that expression. So there it is, uh, the model of the mean written explicitly in subscript notation. We need that because we'll be taking the partial derivative. So find the gradient with regard to a single voxel value. So that's very elementary calculus being applied to the first term in the Poisson log likelihood. So the M is constant. Uh, derivative of the log Q is simply one over Q. So that's why I've got a one over the expression for Q in the top left there. Remember, it's just A theta plus B. So I've just kept that as is. And then by the chain rule of differentiation, we just multiply by the derivative of Q with respect to the single 
voxel value of interest, which is theta j, which will just be one of the terms in that summation. The b is a constant that disappears. One of the terms in, um, in that expression will be theta j, and the coefficient of theta j is simply aij, which appears there. And then minus, again, the derivative of the, the mean value qi. So again, it's just aij, but we keep the summation, of course, um, from that expression um, appearing first in the Poisson log likelihood. So that expression there is kept there. The derivative of that is just aij. Um, so if we were to do some kind of gradient ascent approach, we've got the derivative of the Poisson log likelihood. We just add that to our uh, current parameter estimate, because if we add the gradient, that's going to take us closer to the maximum. So if our value is uh, too large, the gradient is going to be negative, and pull the value down. If, the, if, the, if our estimate is too small, the gradient is going to be positive, and so it's going to increase that value. So that's the obvious intuition of adding on the gradient of the Poisson log likelihood to your current parameter estimate to get closer to the maximum. Now, of course, there is a very rigorous uh, statistical derivation for this algorithm that I'm presenting, uh, expectation maximization. But here, for the sake of time, um, I'm only showing you uh, this gradient-based approach, which is about to now have a slight fudge factor. All I'm saying is, that we scale that gradient by the parameter value divided by what's known as the sensitivity image. It's just a back projection of uniform sinogram data. To understand where that comes from, you'll have to go through the complete data plus some log likelihood, um, expectation maximization algorithm, which I'm happy to do, uh, but I don't have that in my remit today. Um, and if we use that scaling factor for the gradient of the Poisson log likelihood, you can also view it this way, is just nicely delivering a purely multiplicative update. So that means if you start off with a purely positive uh, image estimate theta, it will stay positive throughout your iterative process because A is positive, M is positive, um, and your initial theta is positive, and we just have pure multiplicative updates. Right, so let's see what that, this algorithm does in practice. What that's going to do is step you, using the gradient, it's going to step you closer to the maximum. In practice, then, that means you have a current estimate of your 3D image. Typically, it's just a, an array filled with, a 3D array filled with values of one. You forward model that. For simplicity, consider that as just the line integrals that we've talked about, so just forward model to get a set of sinograms, and as Chris pointed out, in 3D, um, you know, with the MMR, we get about more than 800 such sinograms for span 11, but whatever your geometry will determine the number of sinograms according to the number of rings in your scanner, just forward project. Add on your um, estimate of the scatter and randoms background. That is a model of the mean, which can then be compared to the measured data. So what I'm doing here, by the way, is just looking intuitively at what is dropped out from using the gradient and Poisson log likelihood. Okay? So it says, model the mean, take the ratio of the measured data compared to your model of the mean. So you can consider that as a correction factor in sinogram space. If your mean is larger than your measured data, you'll have values uh, that are less than one and vice versa. So it gives you a scaling correction factor in sinogram space. But we want those correction factors in our image space, so how are we going to do that? We back project those correction factors. So that means we're going to use a transpose to back project those scaling correction factors into the image space, nicely ready to multiply by our image estimate to update it. But of course, there'll be varying numbers of contributions in the back projection. So we need to divide by the number of contributions. You can do that by just back projecting uni uniform sinogram data. Sinograms full of ones, back project them. That gives you the so-called sensitivity image, counting the number of contributions, which will normalize those correction factors. And then that will give you a next update. So the, the intuitive discussion of this 
rather simple iterative algorithm um, comes from, do not forget, that expression at the bottom right. All I've done is write that in matrix vector terms rather than in the conventional um, subscript notation as shown on the lower right there. So it's, uh, I'd argue this is simpler to implement than filtered back projection. It is, all you've got to do is forward project, ratio, back project, multiply. You don't even get to subtract. <laughs> so basic arithmetic. Um, there it is in subscript notation. Here it is in practice, applied first of all to a good old friend, the Shep Logan Phantom. There now at long last, um, raised to that question we had earlier, is my uniform image values theta. I forward model those, and that's going to give me that sinogram um, in, the, in the center of the second row there. So I just forward model, just forward project, gives me that. I take the ratio of my actual measured sinogram compared to that model of the mean, and I plot the ratio up there, that's m over q, and then I back project that. So it's a transpose m over q, divide by a transpose one, and then I multiply that by my uniform image estimate. You can already see that we're getting very close to something that looks like a back projected image, except that we just carry on. And this, of course, sharpens up. And by iteration 40, we're getting closer already to what the true uh, image looks like. This is for the case of noise free data. Um, using a slightly more accurate simulation. Uh, this is using a rather nice big brain phantom from Martin on the second row here, uh, forward projected into a fully 3D set of span 11 sinograms. Um, as I say, actually, just about 800 of those in reality, I've just put the nearest order of magnitude there. Um, so we have a uniform image array forward modeled to simulate the scanner using that model that I showed earlier. We take the ratio and back project divide by the sensitivity image. And now again, you'll see that we'll be able to recover uh, that true object from uh, this noise-free data. So I'm only gonna go up to 64 iterations there. You can see already that the reconstruction uh, is getting closer and closer to the tree. Is this straightforward for everybody? You can see as a quite elementary forward back projection process. So with real data, um, let's show this. Uh, you've got all of those scatters, delays, that's the estimate of the randoms. You've got your attenuation factors, normalization factors. You've actually got your measured data, which I'm calling prompts there. You've got your mu map, which was used to derive the attenuation factors. So in reality, the, you've got all of these sets of sinograms going on in your iterative algorithm. And so I'm just gonna show you what happens, I'm afraid, the, quality of the display is still not good here. Um, first iteration, um, so that's my first update there. What I do is forward project that, that's, sorry, first of all what I do is blur it if I'm gonna model PSF or positron range. So that's the second box in, unfortunately you can't really see much in this display. Uh, forward project, then multiply by attenuation factors, multiply by normalization, normalization factors, add on scatter, add on uh, our estimate of the randoms. And finally, that gives a model of the mean over on the right hand side there, ready for comparison with the actual measured prompt PEP data in the top right there. Gives me the ratio down there, which I can back project, divide by the sensitivity image, gives me a corrective image, which I can then multiply. And you just carry on round with that same process and you can get closer to, uh, that's just 100 iterations. And so here are just some maximum intensity projections of reconstructions from that very data that you just saw uh, in that uh, example. Any questions on real implementation of this iterative algorithm for maximizing the possible log likelihood? Is it well behaved? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it monotonically uh, converges to the maximum likelihood estimate with this nice linear model. Yeah. Um, even though you've got noise 
bits of the image where yep. the zero uh, absolutely but well okay so uh okay now i'm going to confess to you and it does lead on to a later part of this talk we don't really want maximum like at estimates because they will be for the choice of pixels they will actually be very noisy images and in reality uh, for the choice of pixels, nobody really uses maximum likelihood estimates. They either stop the process early or they carry on to nearly getting their maximum likelihood estimate and then smooth it right back down so you can actually see an image rather than have a night sky image. Um, so, um, but theoretically, it's beautifully well behaved and will deliver maximum likelihood estimates, which in reality we don't want for pixels, if that makes sense. So you either need to change basis functions, such as the kernel method, we won't go into that today, but if you were to choose, say, regions of interest, the maximum likelihood estimates could be useful, but for pixels, they, they tend not to be, and so we have to regularize and use maximum a posteriori. Can I ask one more question? Are you gonna yep. talk about the uh, Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. sure. But first of all, maximum likelihood, any other queries? Uh, before we go on to the regularization, um, the algorithm is quite slow because you've got to do a fully 3D forward projection, take the ratio, fully 3D back projection, multiply, and then update for every single iteration. So for 800 plus sinograms, that can get a bit slow, and I think in our current implementation on SURF, it can be quite slow. Um, certainly was slow back in the early 90s when Hudson and Larkin put forward the ordered subsets EM algorithm, which uh, nicely accelerates um, MLEM, but of course compromises uh, maximization of the objective function. But don't worry, because I've just said we don't actually want to maximize that in reality anyway. So if you're going to not run to convergence, and if you're going to post smooth, then OSCM, um, even though it doesn't converge strictly to the maximum likelihood estimate, uh, is fine because we don't want the maximum weight estimate. So let me talk you through this algorithm. There it is, um, just in subscript notation. And the only thing that you need to understand is that this uh, ratio of the measured data to the model of the mean um, is now back projected only over a subset of lines. Rather than having to deal with all of the sinogram data, we can now use, for example, 1 16th or 1 20th, whatever your number of subsets are. You just now access that tiny fraction of the data for the back projection. And if you're only going to back project that tiny fraction, then of course you only need to forward project along that tiny fraction of data. Um, so in practice, with that Shaq Logan phantom that I showed uh, shown earlier, I've obviously got this all running as nice practical demonstrations, but on PowerPoint it's just a a frozen image, I think you can see during the process of what looks like MLEM, here we forward project the image into just, I think I used here 16 subsets. So I only forward project into one over 16 of the data. So it's about an order of magnitude less computation for the forward projection. And then that ratio is now measured to that uh, model data and I only back project one over 16 of the data. So you can see it's easily an order of magnitude faster to then get uh, a multiplicative image update for your parameters. So ordered subsets EM is uh, an unbelievably straightforward concept, but uh, does anybody know how many times this paper has been cited now? <laughs> Countless times. One of the most popular papers, but one of the most simple ideas that's had massive impact in terms of accelerating this method. Yes. I get the impression you use only part of the thing. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. So to clarify, once we've done one update with one subset, we then forward project into another subset. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the case of 16 subsets, after 16 updates, we've actually touched all of the data. And you start the next subset with the uh, reconstructed image. Of course. Which is of course. To the, what you're yeah, so it's as if uh, with one update you're aiming for 
towards the, the maximum likelihood estimate of one subset, then the next update you go, actually, no, I want the maximum likelihood of uh, the other subset, and then the next update, actually, no, I want the other subset. And, and so that's why you'll end up in a limit cycle as you approach, in quotes, something that's not really convergent. You just end up in a constant argument as to which one you're trying to maximize. You just go around in circles. But there are little tricks to get around that, of course. Not that we ever really end up at that level of convergence, as I've just said. It's often terminated early after maybe 60 to 100 updates, or you post smooth. Yeah. Yes? How do you keep the number of uh, how fast do you want it to run? Um, but if you go to two higher subsets, then it can begin to break down depending on how noisy your data are. Because now you're in massive disagreement between your data as you're going around in this massive cycle of disagreement, of changing your mind about what you're maximizing each time. So there are convergent OSEM methods, but in my experience, they only offer you about a factor of two to three acceleration because you end up having to dilute each update by the, the history of the other updates. Um, so I, I would say in practice, I think uh, for the MMR people can help me, I'd say 21 subsets are used. 21? Yeah. So that's the magic number of choice uh, from Siemens at the moment. Which was uh, found rigorously, no doubt. Would it be like a, a, a divisor of the number of views? Well, well, no, but there you're making assumptions yeah. that subsets must be according to the number of views. Sure, in practice, that's a choice, but you don't have to do your subsets that way. But it, it, it does have benefits in the sense that you're back projecting along all lines on a given projection. But yeah, that's tradition, yes. You have to have it as a something that divides evenly by your number of views. But even then, I'd say you don't really have to. You can have a, a different subset at the end. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, 21 for how many views? Uh, is it 252? Something like that? 252, yeah. 300. Oh, it's 24 subsets. Sorry. We, we had mass agreement on 21 just now. What about converging? Right. It changes views. Uh, so they use in, more in, subsets for PSF? If it's 3 or 24, right. right. The, the logic in that is that if you put PSF in, it's going to be a slower to converge yeah. algorithm. So you might want to speed it up uh, by using more subsets. Because that means the time you touch all of the data, you've actually done 24 updates. So because you've got that extra blurring step in there, it's going to take longer to get towards uh, your, your reconstructed image. Any other questions? These are great questions, even though, uh, so it's 21 or 24, yeah. Okay. Let's move on, please. Okay. <laughs> we're, in a, we're in a limit cycle here now. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, um, those are example reconstructions for the HRRT actually showing conventional filter back projection, then OSCM, which because it uses the Poisson noise model um, rather than the least squares model, a Gaussian noise model for filter back projection, we see that it, it correctly models the variation according to the count level. With, with Poisson data, low count means low variance, so low mean means low variance, high mean means high variance, Gaussian. Typically, it's just the same variance for all count levels, and so you end up with um, with noisy backgrounds in, in the low count areas, whereas OSCM and MLEM uh, have much lower noise in those low count regions. And if you start building in the resolution model that I talked about as well, um, you can see it's beginning to sharpen up the image as well by building in that convolution into the system model. Okay, any questions before I get on to regularization and the problem of noise? Uh, one question. Yes. How long do you need? <laughs> oh, roughly. for this. Yeah. Uh, this is about four slides, four or five oh, slides. Okay. okay. How are we doing for time? Am I over already? Yeah. Okay. okay. So we're going to, do you need me to cover this now? Yes. Okay. So with noise, um, no surprise, images degrade dramatically with increased noise. 
should be no surprise there. As I've said, as you head towards maximum likelihood, so they get noisier and noisier according to the lower and lower count level. And so what we do is we can build in uh, a prior probability of a given image theta, and typically we use this uh, Gibbs prior, and I'll explain that now. Um, basically, uh, we have an energy value uh, U, which is high if we think uh, the image is improbable. So a noisy image, we give a large U, and a smooth image, which we are favoring, would give a low energy value, and so therefore a higher probability. So the model that we use for that energy value, uh, if we zoom in on a PET reconstructed image, we can look at a couple of pixels in the image, look at the difference, and then we could, for example, with a quadratic square the difference, with a total variation, we'll take the absolute value of the difference. Huber is a sliding uh, difference between quadratic and total variation. There are many different ways of looking at the difference in values. A noisy image will have a large difference, a smooth image will have a uh, a small difference, and so that allows us to express this energy for a given image candidate. And what we do is also consider the distance, the Euclidean, the, the, the reciprocal of the Euclidean distance between those two pixels, and then we sum up um, all of those differences in that neighborhood relative to a given pixel theta j. So we look at all the different theta c's in that neighborhood, looking at how different they are from the center pixel. And then we do that for every pixel in the image. And that will give us a net energy value. If the image is noisy, it gives a large U. If the image is not noisy, it gives a small value of U. And we're saying we want small values of U because that will give uh, a larger probability of that image being one that what is that claim that we like it. Quick question. So you minimize yeah. high gradient. So in other words, yeah, we're saying uh, if, they're diff if they're large and different, then yeah, we penalize them, which would actually eliminate edges which we don't want to do which is why we want to, to do maybe total variation because that's uh, not going to penalize um, across edges but there are well, I'll come on to that later on today when we talk about synergistic reconstruction I'll give you an example to mitigate that problem so you're sampling with all possible pairs here yes within that neighborhood you could but you could consider the whole image but we use the inverse of the Euclidean distance yeah. between them anyway and so we get tiny when they're far off from each other yeah, you better do it. Like, it's an room. excellent question as to the neighborhood size to use. In my experience, it just comes down to the value of beta, in other words, how much weight we're going to put on this. And you can get away with quite compact neighborhoods because it self propagates all the way along. Yeah. Other questions? I'm, I'm desperately over time, so I have to keep moving. Um, so very rapid um, coverage of a crude algorithm than one that actually is a, a nice algorithm, but the, the, the crude algorithm is easy to derive. Uh, we've got the familiar Poisson log likelihood, and all we've done is now multiply by the probability of the image theta, and we've said the probability of the image theta is just exponential minus u, because u is that energy value where energy is high for the images and so on. So we're going to take the log of this uh, Poisson log likelihood multiplied by the probability, image, the probability of the image, which is now called the posterior. And so we're doing the log posterior, we want to maximize the log posterior. So you can see the Poisson log likelihood there, the m log q minus q, now with simply this penalty term uh, minus beta u. So in other words, if u is large, um, means it's a noisy image, and therefore we're gonna penalize um, um, images that are noisy giving a large log likelihood but then a, a noisy image means sorry won't let you find the maximum at that noisy image so what we can do as we did before is take the partial derivative very similar to what i've shown in previous slides so i won't dwell on it the only difference is we've now got the partial derivative with respect to that energy term in addition to the partial derivative of the Poisson log likelihood and again we can add that gradient to our current image estimate in the steepest descent type fashion and then if as before we manipulate uh, the scaling of that gradient by this choice um, so just like with maximum likelihood expectation maximization we chose that so as to get a, a purely multiplicative algorithm you can do the same here and you end up with a rather crude 
but nonetheless, sometimes useful algorithm called the one step late method. And the only way I can describe it as one step late is if I give you the statistical expectation maximization derivation using complete data. Can't do that today, so you'll just have to accept that it's called the one step late method, because here I've just uh, derived it from a, a gradient perspective. Um, very easy to implement. All you've got to do is just now add on uh, the gradient with respect to uh, the gradient of your energy function. So that's quite easy to do in practice. But what I what we'll be using, I think, um, today is the De Piero method, um, which can just be summarized by these two update equations. Uh, this is going to work for a quadratic because the problem with this algorithm here is if you use a large beta, and um, typically this derivative will, can give you negatives, and you can end up with a negative in this denominator, and you can end up all over the place. Um, but if you choose beta in a sensible range, it can give you seemingly good maximum a posteriori estimates of the, of the parameter vector theta, but it's, it's not guaranteed to converge, and it can be unstable. Anyway, it was published back in 1990 by Green. Whereas De Piero came up with a far more elegant solution where he used a, a surrogate function for the, for the prior. Um, and the update just reduces to this, where all you need is the EM update image and then a so called regularization image which, um, as you can see, looks very much like uh, the derivative of, of a quadratic it's related to that. Now, sorry, <laughs> is that emphatically saying time is up? So yeah. over to the practical now. Um, but those are example images that we can get when we start to regularize. So thank you for your your time there. Over to Chris. Uh, okay. So, uh, but you might see that there are three more demos there. I don't think we'll have. 